Right, welcome everybody. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, please go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. Add your uh, neighborhood council and or organization next to your name and maybe your pronouns. Uh, please include your uh, neighborhood council or organization. Sorry, that always happens. Uh, uh, and also include in the chat what brought you here this evening. And also we're in sort of a unique time right now. Uh, also add how you're adjusting to our new uh, political reality in the wake of the election that happened quite recently. Uh, we are the uh, LA Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance, and our mission is to advance sustainability and resilience across the city through advocacy, sharing of best practices, and community action. We have uh, four really active committees and working groups. They're advocacy, energy, transportation, and trees, and we have a not so active uh, sustainability guidelines for developers uh, working group. You are all welcome to join all of these. We have information about all of them on our um, website and you can also, uh, you can just jump in and join them or um, reach out uh, to any of the chairs or me to get more involved. Uh, today's meeting, tonight's meeting, I guess I should say, is being recorded. Uh, uh, once again, in case you're just joining, introduce yourselves in the chat and uh, this will be a really interactive meeting. So you can uh, use the raise hand feature uh, to um, engage. And we have some community agreements that we will uh, follow uh, quite uh, strictly. And um, uh, we will also have a um, uh, an evaluation at the end that we will really hope you um, uh, complete because we are always hoping to improve our meetings and really do wanna hear from you. Uh, we're going to wrap up these uh, introductions and housekeeping super fast, and then we're going to jump into the agenda. The um, most important thing we want to do is talk about the how we the, we can leverage the Olympics to help make um, Los Angeles more sustainable. And then we're going to hear specifically about a specific a, a particular proposal uh, that might help us do that. And then we will um, hear our committee reports. Uh, which we do most of our meetings, and then we'll uh, hear announcements from you folks. And then, as I mentioned, we'll uh, do announcements. Oh, and evaluations is what I meant. Okay, here are community agreements, which we always want to do. Uh, if you can, turn on your camera and show your face so that we continue to build a community. Please assume good intent and give people the benefit of the, of the doubt. Demonstrate respect and appreciation. Refrain from having too many side conversations in the chat. Uh, we love the chat, we do, and it's open for you, but you know we don't wanna get into tangents. We wanna stay on topic. Uh, listen intently, uh, step forward and then step back, meaning contribute and also let others do the same. Uh, be concise and uh, of course, remember to have fun. Okay, I want to uh, introduce ourselves and um, introduce the board. Sometimes I forget to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Lisa, I'm the executive director of the LANCSA. And let's go to Muriel. Go ahead, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi everybody, um, I'm also a, um, Langsa board, a fellow Langsa steering board member, chair of the transportation committee. Um, I just wanted to have, um, I just wanna make sure if you see that your name is getting changed, I'm changing your name. We might we might have have a vote tonight, but I'm just going to keep it for my my records when I'm when if there should there be a roll call. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I should have mentioned that proposal that I mentioned. Uh, we might or might not vote on it depending on time. Uh, thank you, Muriel, for mentioning that. Uh, Aurora. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Great to see everyone. I'm Aurora Corona. I'm also a board member of the Los Angeles Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance, and I'm also serve on the Pico Union Neighborhood Council. I'll pass it on to Charles. Hey, everyone. Charles Miller on the board. I'm also um, with the Palms Neighborhood Council, where I've uh, been involved with the Green Committee for many years. 
and I am the chair of the Los Angeles Climate Reality Project as well, and love to nerd out, nerd out about native plants anytime you'll to get me talking about it. And I will throw to our last member of the board, uh, Alex, who uh, just returned from a long travel, so take it easy on her. Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Tanglos. Um, sorry, I'm off camera. I'm uh, very under the weather after a long journey back. Uh, good to be here, though. I am, I, as I said, I, I think it was said, uh, Lang's a board member. I was the former chair of the Wilshire Center Koreatown Neighborhood Council Sustainability Committee, and I'm now my law firm's uh, Los Angeles Sustainability Chair. All right, thank you. And uh, Alex is not our last member of the board. We have a very new uh, member, uh, our youth board member who is joining us. Jerry, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey guys, my name is Jerry Yang. Uh, I'm a high schooler in the LA area, in the North Hollywood area. Um, last year I served on the LA Zoo Teen Council for Conservation. Um, I helped plan the Youth Conservation Symposium. And then this year I am serving as the president of the LA City Youth Council. So. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you. And I'm not sure if Carmen, Carmen Chang, are you here? He's here. Hello, Hi. I am. <laughs> Wonderful. If you could just introduce yourself very briefly. I haven't met you yet myself, so this is very exciting for me. Hi, everybody. Um, apologies, we've got a diaper change going on in the process, um, so I might move. <laughs> Nice to meet you, Lisa, and hi, everybody. I see some familiar faces. Uh, my name is Carmen Chang, and I'm the new general manager at the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, or Empower LA. Um, really, thank you, Lisa, so much uh, for inviting me here tonight. Really excited to um, meet you all and hear the conversation tonight. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And I don't know if you'll be able to stay, but I think we'll have more time at the other end of the meeting, and we'd love to hear a few more words for you from you if you're able to stay with us. Um, all right, so let's uh, dive into the, I guess, piece de résistance, we can say. I guess that's fair to say since the Olympics were just in Paris and Becky and Sunny were just in Paris. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Becky Dale and Sunny Sarabian, who are the vice presidents and director, respectively, of sustainability for LA28. Uh, and board members, if you can help me by uh, spotlighting them. And then I'm going to hand it over to you, and you can present on on sustainability for the Olympics. And they'll present for I think 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up to comments and uh, questions from the group here. And uh, we will we'll have a conversation. Sounds great. Thanks, Lisa. Um... It's great to see a large group of people passionate about sustainability in and around LA gathered together on a Sunday night. So uh, thank you so much for inviting us into this forum. Um, Lisa has been kind enough to join us representing NCSA as a member of LA 28 Sustainability Working Group, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Oh, sorry, Lisa, are you asking me to, to Let pause? me say, yeah, I thank you for mentioning that. I meant to mention that. And let me say, I cannot hear you well. Is that just me or, because sometimes it's my audio, but I, and also can somebody spotlight Sunny? Okay, thank you. And is it just me that cannot hear Becky or other people also having trouble hearing Becky? I, I can hear her. We can hear her. Okay. I can hear okay. her, Lisa, too. It's just me. Okay, it's often just me. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it alone then. Okay, I'm glad because I'm not sure. I, I I'm not sure what I would do to fix it, so I'm glad if it's not my. Fair okay. Um, uh, it, anyway, so um, Lisa, who who represents NCSA on our sustainability working group, which we'll talk a bit about later, um, invited us to join this forum and come talk to this group. So, um, thank you to everyone for showing up and and giving us some time this evening. Um. As Lisa mentioned, we're going to do a relatively short presentation just to give you some background on LA28, some of the work we've been doing um, in developing our uh, sustainability plan over the past uh, year plus. And then we're going to open it up to questions because I'm sure um, I'm sure there are plenty. And so we'd, we'd love to kind of be a resource and, and try to answer some of those. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Sunny to kick us off and then I'll uh, I'll pick up part way through the presentation. Okay, thanks Becky. Let me just make sure I'm sharing the screen and the presentation. 
And I apologize. I'm going to go off screen while I'm presenting because uh, I'm trying to multitask a little bit here. Um, but can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, looks good. All right. Let's see. Okay. So um, before Becky dives into, you know, the development of our sustainability strategy and the progress that we're making there, we thought it would be helpful to just take a step back um, and provide a little bit more background information on LA 28 as an organization and the actual scope of the games and the operations. Um, so at a very high level background about LA 28, um, we are an independent nonprofit organization responsible for delivering a fiscally responsible and more sustainable games in Los Angeles in 2028. Um, we're governed by a volunteer board of directors and currently we have about a little under 200 full-time employees. This is going to ramp up pretty significantly as we get closer to the games. Um, and also during the games time, we're looking at probably having 60 to 70,000 volunteers. So it's gonna be a large, large amount of people um, helping to put this games together. Um, so our mission as an organization is to create an unparalleled Olympic and Paralympic experience for athletes, fans, partners, certainly the LA community and for our people. At the core of everything um, that we do, we are a sports organization and we believe that the power of, we can leverage the power of sports to bring together the community and people to help advance progress. We're being very intentional about designing an Olympic and Paralympic Games plan that fits the existing Southern California region and not the other way around. The 2028 Games is actually going to mark the third time LA is hosting the Olympic Games. We um, have hosted them in 84 and 32. And one of the things that we talk about in our organization that is, you know, really special for us is any time we're out in the community or we're just talking and engaging with people about the games, everyone that we've come across has an 84 memory, um, whether that was them going to the games with their family, with their friends, or just the sheer excitement of the city during the games. And so that has been really special for us to hear and all, all that motivates us, you know, um, to really put a special games on again in 28. Also, um, this is going to be the first time that LA is hosting the Paralympic Games, helping to foster dialogue and awareness for people and athletes with disabilities and adaptive sports in general. Um, so the LA Games is actually, the LA Games in 2028 will be the first recent games to build no new permanent venues or arenas for the purposes of the games. As you guys know, LA is home to the most iconic sports teams, stadiums, and venues with experts that operate global events regularly. Um, and this is something that we'll actually be tapping into and leveraging. As you can see um, on the map, there, um, the, oops, sorry. I'm um, looking at the map, you'll see that the game's footprint extends from all the way from Temecula, going up north to the valley, um, we have identified what we call sports sports parks throughout the game's operations. And this is where there's going to be clusters of multiple venues in close uh, proximity. And so that is going to be in downtown LA, in the South Bay, Long Beach, and the Valley. And we'll be using venues like Crypto.com Arena, SoFi Stadium. Um, it's not on the map here, but Intuit Dome, the Rose Bowl, the Riviera Golf Club, just to name a few. And this is going to help ensure that we're creating a shared experience throughout the region. Additionally, UCLA is going to serve as the Olympic and Paralympic Village to the 15,000 Olympian and Paralympian athletes that will be here during the Games um, to compete. The competition venues are the stage for the athletes and the focal point for all the spectator, broadcasters, and guests. Competition venues fall within a few different categories based on how they need to be adapted for the games. This includes existing venues that may require a bit of temporary overlay and infrastructure to meet games requirements. 
um, existing venues that might require more adaptation to prep for the games. So this could be something like the convention center that is um, a blank, blank cam canvas right now. And so we'll have to come in and do some temporary overlay. Um, and Becky will dive into that in the second part of the strategy or second part of the presentation, um, you know, what we're integrating sustainability when it comes to temporary overlay. Um, and then we'll have temporary venues that are gonna go away after the games. So this is gonna be for sports like beach volleyball and surfing. And again, um, we will be the first recent games to not build any new permanent venues or arenas. So before I hand it to Becky, um, this is actually one of my favorite slides because it really just gives you um, an appreciation of the scale of the games. So again, we'll have 15,000 athletes coming in the summer of 2028 to compete. The breakdown is about 10,000 Olympians and um, a little bit over 10,000 Olympians and a little bit over uh, 4,000 Paralympians. We'll be hosting 50 plus sports, 800 different um, events, over 200 countries will be represented. Uh, the stat that we like to use and not sure if we validated this, but it, it's a stat that we use frequently. It's going to be about seven Super Bowl um, games for the span of 30 days. Um, so it just really gives you an appreciation of what it is that we are trying to create for the summer of 2028. I will pause there. And I think we're holding questions towards the end. So Becky, I'm gonna pass it to you. Great, thank you. All right, sorry, let me just get my screen arranged. Okay, perfect. Um, so jumping into sustainability specifically, um, Sunny gave you kind of a little bit of the um, LA28 overview. Um, but again, what our team is focused on is um, looking at how we build and implement a comprehensive sustainability strategy for the games. Um, so today, I just want to walk you through some of the work that we've done to date and the process of developing an impact and sustainability plan for the games. Um, so it includes conducting a materiality assessment, um, forming a community working group, which I mentioned previously, um, working closely with the city and county and building those relationships because obviously they're quite core to these delivery efforts. Um, and then the actual process of identifying some of our focus areas, um, starting to identify some targets and then developing and drafting a, a plan itself. Um, so if we jump to the next slide. So ahead of setting LA28 sustainability strategy, um, back in 2022, we conducted a social and environmental materiality assessment. Um, so this was done with a concept of double materiality. Um, so assessing both risks and opportunities linked to topics that influence LA28's value chain, um, as well as the impacts LA28 can have on the broader economy, uh, the environment, and the broader community. So more than 400 internal and external stakeholders participated um, in this assessment, um, including subject matter experts in economic, environmental, and social impact. So within this assessment, 17 topics were identified as material for LA28, um, with eight topics emerging as most material. Um, and you can see, I, I know this is a busy slide and there's a lot going on, um, but you can see kind of the, the larger bubbles with circles around them are our most material. And then the, the smaller bubbles also circled are our material. Um, and perhaps uh, not a surprise here in Los Angeles, you see transportation up there in the, the top right corner is a, a blinking, blinking red light. Um, but, you know, this was a, a broader reflection of um, some of the um, material issues that we face as a game and that we want to ensure that we're addressing and we're building our strategy. Um, one comment I, I do want to add here is just, um, uh, just because a topic doesn't emerge as material does not mean that we are not going to address the topic. Um, so, you know, one example here is 
climate resiliency uh, and environmental justice. So these are two key components that we know are important to the work that we plan to do and something that we're weaving throughout our strategy. Um, I think, you know, we also recognize through this process that, you know, uh, sometimes wonkier terms like climate resiliency don't resonate versus, you know, a word like heat maybe would have gotten a little bit more attention. So again, th th this doesn't rule anything off the list, but it does just help us kind of identify some key focus areas. So then jumping to the next slide. Um, so, you know, the materiality assessment captured this to some degree, um, but we know that there's a massive amount of expertise on environmental issues here in, in Los Angeles, um, you know, so, some of it within this room. Um, and so we didn't want to make our plan in a vacuum. Uh, sorry, just a second. Uh, uh, child breaking and entering. Um, so in, in 2023, um, we launched uh, the LA28 Community Sustainability Working Group, um, which includes representatives from local community environmental organizations, labor groups, academia, and the city of LA. Um, and, and the goal of this really was that we wanted to bring a lot of voices into the room as we were developing a sustainability plan um, and bring together a diverse group of stakeholders um, from across the region who demonstrated both technical and practical expertise in environmental topics um, and represented multiple scholars to help advise and support LA28 sustainability planning. So we hosted a series of virtual information sessions throughout 2022 um, to share information regarding the formation of the sustainability working group and how organizations could apply to sit on the working group. Um, we also consulted with LA City Council offices on organizations that should be invited to the information session. Um, so organizations were selected to join based on multiple criteria um, and also having the availability to meet on a quarterly basis and review and advise on key sustainability planning documents. Um, so we've been meeting quarterly with this group since June 2023. Um, it's driven a lot of fruitful conversations and, and you know, has been extremely helpful in directing our work. Um, you know, Lisa, you, you, you've been in, I think, every single one of these meetings. Um, I, I don't want to jump out of the presentation, but anything you want to add about the process just as a member of the Sustainability Working Group? Uh, no, actually. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Please go ahead. Sounds good. Um, so, so moving on, with this working group, um, you know, we collaboratively came up with our high level commitment, which is to expand access to a healthy environment. Um, and that framing was very deliberate because we wanted to weave in kind of the equity focus very explicitly. And within this high level commitment, we identified three focus areas, uh, radical reuse, climate, and natural resources. So diving in a little bit deeper on each of these, um, radical reuse is essentially about embedding circularity and reuse throughout our operation. Um, and we're thinking about it primarily in two ways. Um, so the first is designing out waste. Um, this is really rooted in our venue plan, which maximizes use of existing venues, um, because you know I think maybe Sunny uh, said this before, but we say this a lot internally, the most sustainable venue is one you don't have to build. Um, and so you know that that element of reuse is probably the most meaningful action that an Olympic and Paralympic organizing committee can take from a sustainability perspective. Um, but you know, that said, uh, we also know that we will be building temporary venues and overlay as, as Sunny showed on a prior slide. And so in order to reduce that impact, um, we're committed to reusing or recycling at least 90% of those materials, um, which we know kind of based on the assessments put together by the Paris 24 team, um, make up most of our material footprint for the games. Um, in, in addition to kind of looking at that, that venue footprint, um, we're also focused on reducing single-use plastics and maximizing waste diversion at our venues. Um, so we'll be developing um, what we're calling a resource recovery plan um, designed to apply zero waste principles to maximize waste diversion from landfill at our venues. Um, and there are a couple elements that kind of support this. So all venues will have food donation and composting programs. Um, all of our beverage containers will be 
reusable, recyclable, or compostable with a focus on minimizing single-use plastics. Um, all of our venues will offer hydration stations and we will be encouraging spectators to bring their own reusable bottles, again, with a focus on, on reducing waste where we can and then um, diverting it from landfill where, where it does exist. So jumping into the um, climate action and resilience pillar, uh, you know, this is first and foremost about reducing LA28's carbon emissions. And so there are a couple of ways that we're looking at that. Um, you know, two key focuses within that and areas that are both significant contributors to the emissions of a large event, but also um, within our sphere of influence are energy and transportation. Um, so, you know, you guys have probably seen many a news article on this, but we are very focused on hosting a transit first games and, you know, getting people out of their cars as much as possible, um, not allowing parking at venues, working very closely with Metro and um, a group called the Games Mobility Executives that's been convened around LA28 um, to, to maximize that use of public transit for the games. Um, Additionally, um, we are going, we have, sorry, just a second, um, got tripped up there. Um, we are also making a, a commitment to purchase 100% renewable electricity um, for the venues to help reduce the footprint associated with our energy use. Um, and then, of course, this, this kind of came up in the prior area of radical reuse, um, but, you know, one of our significant uh, benefits is the avoidance of embodied carbon. Um, through avoiding permanent venue construction. So we will have zero carbon emissions associated with permanent venue construction. And then beyond looking at our direct footprint, um, we're also looking at ways that we can support climate solutions and inspire action. And so, you know, one, um, and again, I should say that this plan is very much in draft form. So, so none of this is finalized yet. We're still um, working through the, the details, but, um, we are proposing to uh, create a small community climate fund to invest in local climate solutions in lieu of purchasing carbon offsets, which is kind of a more, a more common path for large events, um, so that we are keeping dollars here in LA um, and driving local climate solutions. Um, and then additionally, you know, we think the games provide an excellent inflection point and, and moment for behavior change where we really have an opportunity to inspire Angelinos to travel car free during the games, but also try to extend that behavior change beyond the games. And then our last focus area uh, is preserving natural resources. Um, so at the LA 28 level, um, we've made a commitment to achieve ISO 2012-1 certification, um, which is the leading sustainability standards for events. Um, this was pioneered by the London 2012 Olympics and has since become kind of the industry gold standard around ensuring proper environmental management in the event space. Um, and then we're also uh, ensuring that all of our RFPs, um, so all of our procurement, um, is screened by a responsible sourcing code um, to ensure that all of our suppliers are meeting minimum sustainability standards. Um, but that also we're creating a strong incentive through our procurement process um, for prospective suppliers to raise the bar on sustainability and, and driving progress in that way. Um, and then looking kind of at the, at the venue level on natural resources, um, we're looking at how we can assess and reduce any biodiversity impacts um, in, you know, more focused on temporary venues where there will be some temporary builds. Um, and, and, you know, even though this is, I would say, uh, a bit less material to LA28 than Again, maybe a past game that's building a new arena or a new stadium. Um, it's still certainly an important consideration for our temporary games. So, Sunny, feel free to jump to either the next slide or that's the last slide. Yes, what's next? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, in terms of what's next, you know, as I mentioned, we've been meeting quarterly with our sustainability working group. Um, to shape up kind of this broader framing, this plan, these targets. Um, and so, you know, going forward, um, we're A, focused on finalizing this plan, which as I mentioned is kind of in, in draft format right now. And so we'll, we will release a, a public 
sustainability plan in early 2025. Um, but beyond that, you know, our, our work really turns to how do we actually operationalize this? So how do we take these targets and, and these focuses and actually weave them into all of our games planning to bring them to life? Um, how do we build out carbon and waste management strategies that are um, specifically suited to the games and again, help kind of translate these values into action. And then of course, um, ongoing collaboration with our community and our city and, and county stakeholders. So um, we're, we're four years out, we've got a lot of work left to do. And again, you know, we are relying heavily on um, all of the incredible expertise that exists in these areas within Los Angeles. And so, you know, this is not about getting advice on a plan and then kind of going off into a room and, and implementing it alone. Um, that ongoing collaboration with, with experts in, in both kind of the government and nonprofit sectors are, is key for us to be able to actually realize these goals. And so with that, um, I will stop talking because I've, I've been talking for a few minutes um, and I'm happy to jump into the Q&A portion. Lisa, does that sound good or, or I'll, I'll take your cue from here. That sounds perfect, thank you. Uh, so board, if you can uh, stop spotlighting Becky and Sunny and then we'll open it up for conversation and I already see some raised hands. So this is the time to raise your hands. I want to remind everybody we have a strict, uh, I mean, if I didn't say this before and I perhaps didn't, but I will say it now, we have a strict uh, enforcement policy of our community uh, agreements. Uh, we have kicked people out and we will kick people out if you don't follow them, just so you know. But this looks like an, a well-behaved group. Um, so yeah, let's have a conversation. Um, Glenn. Thank you. Um, two topics, one solid waste. Um, is this going to be handled by the city of LA Bureau of Sanitation or will it be the private um, haulers that um, you know, have that are assigned to different parts of the city that take waste to the surrounding landfills and what type of guarantees that for either either option or both that in fact the recycling and all that anything that you haven't been able to reduce and get you know get get out of the waste stream is in fact recycled. There's a, a great concern, probably especially for the private haulers that they just dump it in the landfills. Um, and then the second topic is Sepulveda Basin. Um, you know, sustainable, I mean, it's great to say you're not gonna build new facilities, but in the things that I've heard about the basin, um, you know, it's not just, it's not just using an existing facility I understand that there's going to be um, grading, the removal of native vegetation, um, even more, and obviously that takes energy, that takes that's displacement of native native habitat, et cetera. Um, and so maybe you could drill a little bit down on those on that impact. And correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, if you're using an existing golf course for something, could be golf or something else. You know, that's one thing. But if you're doing what we've heard, which is to dig big holes in existing uh, tree-filled parklands to put in a water feature, you know, that is not the same as, in my opinion, in terms of the impact. So you could comment okay. on both those. Thanks. Okay, and I'm gonna ask everybody to be super succinct because we, unfortunately, uh, Becky's leaving soon. And also please everybody introduce yourself briefly. Uh, okay. All right. Um Sunny, do you want to take the first one on waste? And I'm I'm happy to tackle the second one. We're we're gonna to try to divide and conquer a little bit here, but Sunny's our, our waste guru. Sure. Um, so that's a great question. And to be quite frank, we are in the preliminary conversations with LA Sanitation. Um, we do know, we you know we're very uh we, we talk to them quite frequently, and uh their chief sustainability officer sits on our working group as well. I would say you know, we are keeping a close eye on the franchise zones and the extension of those contracts. I think they're set to expire in 2027. Um, as we are setting our strategy, you know, I can't say 
which direction we're completely going to go in right now, just because we are in the preliminary stages of really putting the waste strategy together. I think the general rule of thumb is we are going to lean in um, and work closely with the venues to see, you know, the venue operators where we'll be having our sports, they know how to operate the venues um, pretty down to a T. So we will most likely be tapping into the services that they have um, with the haulers. And then, you know, for us, we're really going to have to understand where all the waste is going, um, especially if we want to divert the compostable waste streams, which I know is currently a challenge in Los Angeles. So all that to say is it's just a little bit too soon for us to say, you know, if we are going to go with one hauler or if we are going to tap into the waste franchising zones but we will be doing everything very closely with the city of LA and with LA sanitation and the one thing I might just add on that is an, another Eric is actually um it's a timely question so Sunny and I were out at the USC game yesterday at the Coliseum just to get a look at their uh operations on on waste because they um they do a pretty nice job of, of waste diversion at that facility. Um, and so we were observing to see what they're doing and understanding, you know, what of that is transferable to the games environment. Because again, we want to build on those existing best practices where we can and, and frankly use the games as a bit of an incentive for the venue community in LA um, to kind of raise the bar leading up to the games because it's not just about have, although obviously our first priority is having sustain, more sustainable operations during the games, if we can kind of incentivize that improvement that remains beyond LA 28, um, that, that's really kind of the, the gold standard that we're looking for. Um, but, but another kind of key element for us when we look at how we manage waste is how we manage procurement. So how can we be really thoughtful about all of the food and beverage operations, particularly everything that's getting handed out in the facilities and, and how can we leverage our purchasing power across the scale of the games to bring in kind of the, the right materials um, across all of these venues so that we're kind of setting ourselves up for success on the back end with waste, if that makes sense. And then to, to tackle the second question about Sepulveda Basin, I, I don't think we are the right person to go deep on specific venues today, just to be candid, I would rather have someone from our venues and infrastructure team go into that. What I can say is that we will be doing um, biodiversity kind of assessments for, for our temporary venues. And so the concerns you're voicing around, you know, native vegetation and wildlife are being taken into account. But again, you know, none of those plans are set in stone yet. So that, that work is very much in progress. So, um, if you've heard that something is definitely happening in Sepulveda Basin in terms of a specific construction plan, um, we are not there yet. So the, the work is happening and those biodiversity applications are very much being considered. All right, thank you. Andrea. Thank you. My name is Andrea Leon Grossman. I'm a Mexican born immigrant and environmental justice advocate. I, uh, I have two quick questions. One is uh, in terms of the budget for the LA city, we are just like making really painful cuts right now. And I know that I'm gonna share this link right now about uh, cost overruns. And uh, the summer Olympics, the last time we hosted it in the US uh, in Atlanta, we went 151% over budget. So I'm concerned that not only this is gonna cost us way more than we anticipate, but that it might lead to other costs uh, cutting that um, basically will prevent us from um, investing in things that we really need to invest in terms of the sustainability. And then also all the carbon footprint that comes with this and um, the way that we are arming the police. And um, I, I think it's just uh, another way to oppress um, those who are most vulnerable, and uh, I, I'm just again concerned as as a as a Latina and as uh, someone who's seen police brutality just grow and grow and grow in, in the city. I'm very concerned about uh, the repercussions of this budget, and um, again, I'm just uh, cost overruns and in the way that we are managing our budget, uh, I'm just very concerned. Hi, 
Andrea, thank you for your comment. Um, do you have a specific question for, for me that you'd like me to answer regarding environmental sustainability specifically for the games? Like how are you going to guarantee And, and, and I apologize. I, I don't mean to minimize. I just want to make, there were multiple topics in there. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm hearing you. How, how would you guarantee that we're not going to go over budget and that we're not going to add more burden to communities of color, especially low income communities who are being already um, oppressed by a really corrupt system. Um, also, just real quick, in terms of uh, reducing single use plastics versus eliminating them, I think it's, it, that's doable with uh, both reusables, both on cups and, and silverware and plates. And you just charge a deposit, you know, two or three dollars. People will always uh, return those those um, items. And I think there's an opportunity for workforce in terms of you know sanitizing those um, cups and plates, and us not since not producing any waste at all at venues. Thanks, Andrea. So I I am uh, I I'm not the right person to speak to to overall budget conversations. I, I'm not in our finance department, so I, I don't again I don't want to step out of my lane here. Um, on uh, the the comment about you know, kind of single use plastics, I I will say we're absolutely working to see how we can push the limits of reducing single use plastics. And and you're right that reusables are are a great opportunity for us. So. Um, certain sports venues in LA, um, the, the Coliseum for USC football games is using reusable cups to some degree. Um, those have also scaled up recently at crypto.com arena where the, the Lakers and the Kings play. Um, so we'll be out there checking that out in person um, in a couple of weeks actually. So we are looking at these best practices in the sports industry to understand you know, where, where we see opportunities to minimize single use plastics. And, and that was you know part of, um, the, the decision to promote, you know, reusable bottle use is to actually to enable spectators to um, come in and bring their own bottle instead of purchasing water. So um, we are doing some some work on that front, certainly. Um, but again, we are four years out, so we, we are very much still information gathering and planning. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charles. Hey, uh, Becky and Sunny, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, in uh, the years prior to the uh, 1932 Olympics, uh, the Olympic Committee with the city of LA planted 25,000 Mexican fan palms in Los Angeles. And so as a result of the Olympics happening here in 1932, Los Angeles became identified with a species of tree that provides no shade whatsoever for the people living in the city, is not a native species that provides no biodiversity support for the ecosystem, and uh, really is a kind of a, a misplaced uh, part of our urban forest that is still here today throughout the system. Flash forward to now and uh, Metro is uh, fast tracking a number of project, projects throughout the city, spending billions of dollars to do what you were talking about, which is to uh, make our transit system as effective as possible leading up to uh, the Olympics. The landscaping, however, as part of this new of these new installations is usually an afterthought. And they often use the same old uh, non-native species when they're doing this. Uh, our board is putting on, I didn't introduce myself, Charles Miller from the LENCSA board. We are uh, talking about putting together a coalition with some other organizations to support an initiative to ask that all of these new bus stops and train stops include mandatorily in their design a large native species canopy tree that can be used to provide shade for people who are using the buses, used to provide shade for people who are waiting for the train, while also promoting climate justice for people going on in the future who use public transit, and also promoting biodiversity in our urban forests, as well as a geographical identity that is much more powerful than a species of tree that is from far away. Uh, will LA28 be receptive to endorsing and supporting uh, an effort like that, a coalition like that? Thanks for the question, Charles. Uh, I don't think that's something I can answer on the spot. I can tell you we're, we're certainly pro shade and pro native plants. Um, we, we generally don't do a lot of endorsements, frankly. Um, 
So I'm certainly happy to hear it out. Again, not something I can weigh in on on, on the stage right now. Um, but we are, I, I will say we are having conversations with um, USD Public Exchange about their urban trees initiative. We are talking to the city's uh, chief, uh, chief tree officer, Rachel Mallard. So we are we are having conversations about how the games um, can spur improved access to shade and increased tree planting. Um, but um, which, which I know doesn't directly answer your question. So um, this this might be one we we have to take offline. Okay, I'll engage with you after this. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Scott. Hi, I'm a student from Cal State Long Beach. My name is Scott. And my question is, um, what's your plan to perhaps have partnerships with ride sharing companies or bike sharing services to min minimize car usage during the games? And then on top of that, a plan to change LA residents like norms about car dependency in general. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I can tell you we don't have current partnerships in those spaces right now. Um, we are we are looking at ways that we can um, make make biking to the venues an attractive option and, and facilitate that. Um, and then you know, with rideshare, um, I think obviously we we know everyone traveling to the games. Uh, is doing so of their free will, and and so people people may take rideshare, but you know our objective is really to get people out of out of cars and onto uh, buses or or other kind of collective forms of transit. Um, so so that's a bit more where our focus is. Um, and then in terms of um, in, inspiring that behavior change, it's a great question, um, and and we have not put together a a campaign around that yet. You know we do work closely with with Metro and um, together with Metro formed a group called the Games Mobility Executive that um, is advising on transit for the games. And so um, it's absolutely in the plans. And I think what makes this opportunity so powerful is the, the global stage and the attention of the Olympics and, and the opportunity to get athletes involved. You know, one thing we've seen, um, we have a number of former Olympians and Paralympians on staff at LA 28 for our athlete fellowship program. And, and we see that a number of athletes are actually quite passionate about sustainability. And so I think there's a huge opportunity there for us to leverage athletes as ambassadors around transit and kind of gain some of that attention. Um, but, but that's, um, you know, more to come on that topic. Okay, um, AJ. Yeah, I'll try to make mine quick. So I'm just curious because I haven't been fully in the weeds of this, but I guess just in hearing that a lot of the venues are going to be temporary. So, I mean, are they going to be made of materials that, you know, could be reused or, you know, redistributed for other events? Or I, I just want to make sure I understand that correctly. Yeah, it's a great question. Um... So, you know, our, our, our first choice with temporary venues is to rent materials um, because then we, we know that the business model is built for those materials to get reused and that they already, you know, generally are already exist in the ecosystem. And so, um, you know, that, that is kind of a tried and true business model in the sports and temporary event industry. So that is kind of our, our, our first priority is to rent as much as possible. We know that won't be possible for 100% of the temporary venue materials, but we really want to maximize that as much as possible. Um, and then, you know, where renting is not possible, um, what we do want to look at is how do we how do we design for disassembly so that materials can be taken apart into reusable components and then, um, you know, find reuse channels either through being bought back by the supplier or sold secondhand or donated. So that's kind of the order of operations that we think about there. But there is a significant rental industry um, that we do plan to rely on for those temporary venues. All right, thank you. Anne. Hi, sorry. Um, hi, I live in Marvista and I'm a member of the Climate Reality Project. Um, my question is whether the 2028 Olympics will have fireworks 
Um, it just seems like a, a simple decision whether or not to have fireworks that doesn't impact any venues or any, like any logistics. It's just fireworks or no fireworks. But f having fireworks, as I'm sure you know, has a negative impact on air quality and wildlife. So um, I, I don't, I, my question is whether you know that at this time. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, we don't have an official policy on it at this stage, but it's a point that I'm happy to to take back to our um, our ceremonies team to to point out. Um, not not the first time it's been raised, but that that's why we're here is to to hear these comments and and filter them back. Thank you, Christian. Hi, thank you for this meeting as well. Um, my name is Christian Robinson. I'm the executive director at a 501c3 pending called Sound of Earth. We work in sustainability, music, and the intersection of uh, all those cultures. And we also seek to educate on everything related to net zero, as well as introducing the language of carbon negativity into the conversation and seeking a little bit more of a, you know, the, the further you reach, the closer, the closer you'll be able to get to that point is our mindset. So I think um, my key question is, is it possible to address the carbon management issue from a framework where we say, um, how can we actually be carbon negative or net zero at these games, as opposed to just reducing our emissions and preventing by means of avoidance? Um, what does that strategy look like? Uh, who's the point person? And um, how is that question evolving? And again, thank you for your efforts. This is an amazing, <laughs> ginormous task. And uh, I admire anybody who takes it on. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, and, you know, it, it's an interesting topic. And I think one that is still evolving. I think what we've seen through our research and through a lot of the feedback we've gotten is that there was a, there was definitely a trend of events claiming carbon neutrality. Um, and that was generally largely enabled through offset purchases. Um, and um, I think what we found was that um, uh, over time, those pledges came to be seen as kind of disingenuous because, you know, with events, there were, as with, you know, anything, but, you know, there were certain unavoidable instances that at least in, in the short term, um, there, there was no path on it. So there was substantial reliance on offsets. And, you know, that actually caused like in, in Europe, some, you know, litigation and regulatory action. Um, and elsewhere, I think it was just kind of became poorly received. And so we actually have, have stayed away from the idea that we would make any kind of claims around carbon neutrality or even carbon, uh, carbon negativity, although we hadn't discussed that one particularly. Because I think we we have a lot of opportunity to reduce, and we are pursuing that. But I think we also know that by 2028, um, there we will have some carbon emissions that we are not able to abate, um, and so we we don't want to convey otherwise to the public. And so that that's kind of how we're thinking about it. Um, always happy to hear different points of view. But I think what, what we've heard more is just that we don't want to, um, you know, we don't want to risk giving a false impression uh, to the public that the game is, is literally zero emission when we know it won't literally be zero emission because there will be sources that we, we don't have uh, means to directly abate in 2028. Thank you. Eric. Hello there. Uh, my name is Eric Sheehan. I'm with No Olympics LA. Um, we're concerned about wonderful groups like these being used by organizations like LA28 to wrap the games in good vibes, uh, sometimes called greenwashing. Uh, but more specifically, is there a plan to reuse the materials from the $100 million Memorial Coliseum raised floor platform project? Um, and is poured concrete being used in temporary venue infrastructure? Uh, do you know where that's happening and how much is planned to be used? Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, so I, I'm not, again, I, I can't go into a ton of venue by venue specifics. What I can say is I, I mentioned earlier in my presentation is that, you know, we are taking a goal to reuse or recycle at least 90% of the materials from our temporary infrastructure and overlay. And so that would encompass all of our competition venues, which does include Memorial Coliseum. Okay, thank you. 
Commissioner Waters. Good evening. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is pertaining to public safety. Based on the attendance at the Paris Olympics, uh, which was 9.5 million, what in the budget was emergency preparedness factored into the budget, considering that we are so spread out that the um, 1994 earthquake shook for eight seconds? Um, what would what is the current plan for that? We will have hotels, motels, Airbnbs, which we didn't have in the 84 Olympics, uh, transportation, various sources. Uh, each venue would likely have evacuation in place, but has all of that been factored into the budget? Are you aware? Hi, Karen. Um, Hi. I am, I am, I, I appreciate the thoughtful question. I am not the right person to answer that question because I'm specifically focused on environmental um, sustainability. So unfortunately, I can't give you an answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Fred. Fred Kuhns from the Mar Vista Transportation Infrastructure and Sustainability Committee. Um, I'm wondering about the interaction between scheduling and transportation, and specifically if you've been able to bridge uh, communications between uh, scheduling and uh, LADOT or possibly Caltrans in order to minimize congestion uh, because uh, congestion leads to emissions and even using transport, there will be uh, a number of cars as well as uh, buses and other vehicles on the roads. Great question. Um, I'm going to caveat this one, I, and I feel like a bit of a broken record that I'm, I'm not a member of transportation team, so I'm not necessarily the right expert to speak to this, but I will say that I know transportation demand management it is very much a part of the, the strategy, so it's not just getting people onto buses, but also looking at um, how, how are we minimizing overall traffic on the road at, at the times that um, the venues will be in peak operation. So it is congestion is very much being considered as a factor. And, and to your point, we know that that um, not only has kind of operational and time implications, but also has um, implications for, for uh, carbon emissions and air quality. And okay. Lisa, uh, I'm just gonna, because it's 728, I'm gonna flag that I think this probably needs to be the last question. Okay, well, we have two more hands. Uh, I guess we'll see what we can do. Um, and I know we talked about, okay, well, we'll see what we can do. Uh, and maybe Sunny can take the last one if you have to go. Uh, Mark. I'll be quick. Um, uh, Becky and Sunny, thanks for being here tonight and uh, for the presentation and great questions from the community tonight. Um, my name is Mark Forbes. I'm a sustainability specialist and a true advisor for Zero Waste. Um, how do I start working with you? Um, why don't we, why don't we connect offline? <laughs> um, all right, that was, that was not, that was a mini question. So let's do one more and, and then we'll <laughs> Oh, I mean, maybe Miron has his hand. I can't, I'm sorry, this thing keeps popping up. I didn't see Miron's hand raised. Aurora. Aurora. I mute you... myself, sorry. Thank you again for this presentation, very informative. And like everyone said, great questions that I hadn't thought about. But my question really is about community engagement. I live in Pico Union. I was there in the 1984 Olympics and the traffic was horrendous. And I actually used my bike or walked to the locations that were by the Coliseum. So my question is more on the community engagement to reduce uh, the, what have you done uh, as far as engaging with the community and getting feedback for reducing the impact to the communities that are next to the venue. And I know you have uh, obviously a community, um, an advisory board or a committee for engagement have very has there been talk or changes or something 
in regards to reaching out to all of these communities that are really in the nucleus of where all these uh, events and venues are going to be? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I have a colleague, Eric Aldridge, who's our vice president of Impact, who, who kind of owns that piece of the work around community engagement. And so uh, I, I'm not going to give you a great specific answer because it's not my area of expertise. There is absolutely intent to do that community engagement. I, I'm not the right person to give you the specifics on exactly who has been engaged to date and, and what the rollout plan, um, but it is, um, it, it is in, in the plans. So, sorry, I know that's a big answer. No, well, thank you, Becky, because we had none in 84, and I'm hoping that it needs to start soon uh, so you can get some feedback from the uh, members, the residents, uh, because they'll have a lot to say. Yeah, well, I can certainly, I, I can take that back, so. Thank you. Uh, maybe Sunny can take the question from Iran. Would that work? Sure. Uh, Yep, I have a hard stop too, but I'm happy to to take the yeah, last I'll, one. Yeah, we can both stand for one more, and then and then we'll really stop. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Becky. Uh, my question is: How can the city of LA put a quick plan to increase the green belt in major streets and to Olympic stadiums and venues? That's my question. It's a great question, um, and. I see at least one familiar face from the city on here, although I'm not going to put them in the spotlight. But I mean, it, we, we, I, what I can say is that we're, uh, that is a, that is a, a question that it really involves the, the city of LA, who, who is our close partner, who, who we work with. And so, you know, we, we are having some of those conversations around how do we, um, how do we move faster on a variety of projects before, before 2028? And so um, I don't have a great specific answer for you, but um, I'm going to put this one in the bucket of um, things I, I will take back and, and share with my my colleagues and my partners at the city to say um, inquiring minds want to know. So okay. thank you. All right. Well, um, thank you all for having us this evening. I, I hope we shared a bit of useful information. Um, you know, obviously there there's a lot still in the works and, and more to come, but um, it, it was great hearing all of your thoughtful questions tonight. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you. It sounds like maybe next, maybe we can have you back and maybe there can be, maybe we should have uh, more folks back. Cause I think, you know, all of these things are very connected, right? And uh, maybe we can have folks from transportation and folks from community engagement along with the sustainability folks back so we can have a more integrated conversation. I think that might be uh, helpful. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much. And the work continues. And we have four years and time time flies, as we know. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh, and I see that Carmen is here. And I don't know if Commissioner Susana Reyes is here, because I saw her earlier. And I would love to thank her for being here as well. Uh, but I'd love to hear uh, uh, a, a couple words from our new general manager, if you want to say a few uh, words, Carmen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, Lisa. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, and, and yeah, hello, Aurora and, and others. Um, uh, so let's see here. I hope everyone's going to have, you know, it's having a great weekend. Uh, my, mine has been super, super busy. I think with the holidays coming up, it's it's not just uh, the, the work, but it's also the, the non-work, right? Um, so I, ho I hope that everyone is um, taking care of themselves. So um, if I haven't met you yet, uh, my name is Carmen Chang. I've been um, working as the general manager uh, for about five, a little over five months now. And um, I know everyone keeps asking, how, how's everything going? It's busy. It's busy, right? It, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, it's been busy. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Um, I, I know for the first uh, two to three months uh, doing some some Zooms um, across the city to meet um, with nearly 99, all 99 neighbor councils just to get a sense of, um, you know, introductions. How's everyone doing? Um, the, the work, um, things that folks are really excited about the challenges, um, and then kind of the road ahead, right? How can the Empower LA department support you and your work? Because we know that 
everyone here is a volunteer um, for quite, you know, for some folks, um, you know, been with the neighbor council system for quite some time, um, some relatively new and some very, very new. And so how can we make sure that everyone is supported um, to make sure that, you know, you're fe you're feeling like you're making a difference in your community and I'll just say off the bat, I mean, Lisa, thank you for inviting me to the Sustainability Alliance. I mean, the fact that um, we've got so many participants um, listening in to hear updates um, from LA 28 about the upcoming Olympics and, you know, shows you all really care, right? Um, uh, the fact that you're here on behalf of your neighborhoods, but also, you know, caring about what's going on in, in the city overall. So I just want to say thank you so much um, again and again for, for your service. Um, Work has been good so far. Um, you know, I, I'm excited to um, just work very collaboratively with neighborhood councils. Um, I know that sometimes, uh, you know, I, I think from I, I, I try to put myself in the shoes of others. And if I were to be a neighbor council volunteer, right. And that's this is what I've been hearing across the city, which is, you know, we don't really understand kind of the the, the administrative challenges. Some, sometimes it's very burdensome to do X, Y, Z, for example, plan a community event or things that are coming up. And we're talking about in four years with the Olympics coming. But next year, um, you know, are the neighbor council elections. And I know for some folks on this call, candidate filing has already begun um, as of Friday. So there's lots going on. And. I feel like our job here at the Department of Neighbor Empowerment is to really make sure that, you know, we can really support in those processes when, you know, you're talking to other city departments, for example, that we can be your best advocate, um, that we can provide that information. We may not have all the answers all the time, but we would want to make sure that, um, you know, we, we can help you become successful uh, to be a neighborhood council board member. Um, so that's that's our highest priority. Um, the second one being, uh, you know, making sure that Angelinos uh, writ large understand uh, that, you know, there's a place for them in the city of Los Angeles, that neighborhood councils are the voice, um, are their voice at City Hall. So um, wanting to make sure that, you know, if, if folks are feeling you know, they're not being heard, um, that there's a place for them to, you know, when we come together, we can really make a difference um, through advocacy, through organizing, and that that's some of some of my background. So, um, just you know, happy to answer questions if if anyone has them. But just want to say thank you so much for, um, you know, inviting me and providing the space. Um, I'll also share some quick updates because um, since LA28 has has just been on, um, if folks haven't already received the invitation. I know the um, the mayor's office um, of inter the International um, uh, Affairs Department, alongside with community engagement, have sent out an invitation. It is going to be uh, Thursday, December 5th from 6 to 7 p.m. It's going to be online on Zoom to talk about the 28 uh, games. And, you know, this is an another opportunity for neighbor councils to ask questions, share feedback um, to the mayor's office. So if you haven't RSVP, I think especially for this alliance, please do so. And I believe when you RSVP, there's a there's a section where you can ask questions, you know, so for the planners have those questions, you know, ahead of time and they can you know, prepare to answer them. Um, so that's one. And then um, uh, hopefully folks have seen this already as well, but um, 25 years, um, there, there will be a celebration of neighbor councils. Yeah. So that will be at City Hall um, Friday, December 13th at 6 p.m. So same thing here. If you haven't received the invitation, please reach out. Um, and, I, you know, we, we want to make sure folks have RSVP. There's a special code because, you know, it's we, we want to make sure that we can accommodate as many people to City Hall as possible. So take a look and um, again, thank you for having me and happy to answer any questions. Actually, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know if we have time for questions uh, because we have we have a, a presentation connected to the Olympics. Um, but thank you very much, Carmen, for joining us. I, I it was uh, I know you've been making the rounds and I'm really excited that you are here and. Um, I look forward to, uh, you know, it's been a, as you know, 
I mean, that's probably why you're here to be candid. It's been a bit of a bumpy ride with uh, Dunn. Uh, so I'm excited about a, a new and brighter future. So thank you. Thank you for being Lisa. here. Thanks, everybody. Um, I am going to now turn it over to Christine and uh, our Monique and uh, Michael here with you. Oh, you are muted, Christine. I believe so. Yes, I did see both their names on the participant list. Okay, wonderful. All right. Uh, so, board, if you can help me, if you can um, uh, spotlight uh, Christine and Monique and uh, Michael, I will hand it over to them and let the three of you uh, introduce yourselves. And okay. this is a presentation, a proposal connected to the Olympics. And I think we probably, we might have, we might or might not have enough time to vote on this. It might be a little bit too controversial and um, weighty and sticky for us to vote on it tonight. It might not, but at least we can start diving into the conversation and uh, we'll see. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa. Appreciate it. Um, we sincerely yeah, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to your members and uh, the board and to introduce ourselves uh, to present our vision and plan for a greener and more sustainable Olympics with respect to organic waste. Um, this is a joint presentation. So uh, between LA Compost, uh, Compost Ball LA, 301 Organics, We've all been working in the food waste recovery and composting space for over a decade now. And we are actually the first groups to tackle the food waste uh, problem and bring local composting to the LA region uh, dating back to 2012, 2013, um, well before AB 1383 was even signed into law. And so we have quite a bit of experience and qualifications in this realm. Um, to help reach uh, the lasting legacy the city of Los Angeles is hoping for. Um, my name is Christine Lynchesinkle. I'm the founder of 301 Organics, and we proudly served the Rose Bowl Stadium and Brookside Golf Course for eight years, uh, developing their uh, program and managing their own food waste recovery, diversion, and on-site compost use program. Um, I'll introduce just briefly Michael from LA Compost. He's the executive director. He will uh, be sharing a few slides as well about his organization's role and success in the community with their composting hubs. And then we'll sh have Monique uh, Figueredo of Compostable LA, um, a local zero waste event planning business. Um, she'll speak and share some key elements of our proposal. So our goal tonight is uh, really to share um, our proposal to, to earn your support so that we may uh, possibly present this plan to uh, LA28, the mayor, city council for their endorsement as well. Um, so our collective mission is uh, it's a partnership um, to develop and accelerate the creation of permanent green jobs in the organics management and sustainability sector um, to ensure the responsible growth in our communities to positively affect global climate change locally. And collectively, we've been working in the zero waste food recovery composting space for 14 years now and we're intimately familiar with the ins and outs of our current waste management system, and, it, and it's broken. Um, we are here to help turn things around, share what we know, and offer a viable alternative to the traditional hauling model um, to help build a different kind of composting infrastructure that is local and it benefits our communities in the long run. So we, we do believe the uh, LA Olympics can be a catalyst for this kind of change. Um, but to achieve this, we, we really are going to need support from, from the communities to make this happen. Um, moving on, uh, the creation of the green jobs is at the core of our proposal, and these jobs are tied to the composting industry. Uh, the industry that converts food and green waste and 
and into healthy soil for our ball fields, our turf grasses, our golf courses, and our shade trees. Um, managing our urban turf grasses and ball fields with compost offers a myriad of benefits, including water conservation, uh, cooling the local climate, protecting our youth from exposure to toxic chemical fertilizers. These green jobs are also tied to advances in emerging technologies that we're familiar with that are designed to process large volumes of food waste at the source and where it is generated. Um, On-site or local processing infrastructure avoids the pollution from the unnecessary hauling of this material to distant facilities um, as it creates uh, the very greenhouse gases we want to avoid. And then, um, oops, one more. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Building uh, the local composting infrastructure is really where we're targeting um, to install these technologies. Um, and it will require a workforce, a trained, qualified, experienced workforce to manage these operations. And I'm going to hand this off to Michael. Um, this would be your slide. Awesome, thanks, Christine. I'm not gonna um, just go through each slide. That's for you all to kind of review. I, I just wanna kind of echo Christine's words and also kind of speak a little bit of my lived experience. Having been born and raised in LA, I think there's something powerful when we're able to um, center resources back into community, specifically along the lines of these conversations of waste and environmental justice. As we all know on this call, there's no such thing as a way. That typically means it's going somewhere that is not our zip code. And oftentimes it's poor BIPOC communities that bear the brunt of large events and waste. So uh, I think for us, it's how do we see it as resources that we can reinvest in our community, centering um, soil health, human health, and the collective health of the decentralized zip codes that make LA County. Um, I'm really excited about how we can tr create something that transcends just the games because this is our home that um, is before 28 and after 28. So how can we use utilize something like this to springboard something good in long term? Um, and really just um, leaning into the power and individual genius of communities and what they bring to the table. I think localizing the system does a ton of good from creating a level of trust and transparency that it often is lacking within um, resource recovery and management, right? Um, by keeping it local, you see it processed right in front of you. You, you get that material re, uh, redistributed at the parks, golf courses, et cetera. Um, but to this slide's point, it's changing policy as well. We are um, helping change policy at the state level. We've been helping lead it here at the city level. And I think we can kind of build upon um, what we've already started, at least within parks across the city. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Christine, please. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I'm I, sorry, I wanna interrupt, at least for me, maybe it's just me, but the slides, uh, the, I don't know what the word is. The size, the, oh, somebody help me with my words. Are you not seeing the full slide? I'm not seeing the full slide. Thank you. Thank you oh. for helping with my words. Yeah, I'm not seeing the full Is slide. Is anyone else having this problem? Everything I'm not. Looks, looks, looks good to me. to me. Okay. Okay, that's weird. That's really weird. Okay, that's very weird, but I'm not. Maybe it's just me. That's I don't know what that means. I'll <laughs> shut up. Go ahead. No, happy to send it to you after the fact as well. <laughs> um, I think the root of what all three of us do focus on is like nothing we do is in isolation or in a vacuum. Um, strong biological systems on planet earth do not focus on isolated experiences or efforts but redundancy in the system and diversity within the system and that's what i think we help each of our orgs bring to the table i started la compost over 12 years ago and i'm happy to say that we now work with the city of los angeles and the county of los angeles both within the recreation and parks department and their la sanitation department working with the County of LA, which closed the Puente Hills landfill and is now turning it into a regional park with an environmental justice center and composting facility as well. Um, Christine has a ton of experience within 301 Organics in and around the Pasadena area with advanced technologies in larger venues like Rose Bowl and um, has done a ton as in regards to workforce development. And then Monique, who you'll hear from as well, um, a woman-owned business within um, compost recovery from the residential side to large-scale events from the the Emmys and a different award show. So I think each of us bring a little bit of a, a lot of bit of lived experience to um, have some insight on how to pilot some of this at 
key venues that that we intend to propose. So, um, yeah, Great. passing it on. So, Monique. hi guys, hello. Um, so. Uh, at the the heart of our proposal is going to be supporting um, local businesses, local nonprofits, and local jobs. Um, so I think um, in a large in and in a, in a massive way, there's been a lot of resources placed into major waste hauling and commercialized composting systems, and we're trying to provide an alternative to that that prioritizes. Um, localized community infrastructure uh, and um, like Michael said, transparency and um, environmental justice. And so some of the jobs that we'll be looking to create are gonna bolster these things. So one of them is composting site managers, people who can um, oversee local composting projects, whether those are in community parks or right on site. So limiting the amount of hauling. That way, if people do say, hey, what is happening? I know that was one of the questions. What's happening to the material? Where is it going? You can come visit these sites, see exactly what's happening to the materials, meet with composting site managers, see the skills they're learning. So really fostering that transparency, but also um, creating a, a deep well of knowledge. Um, zero event um, zero waste event coordinators. This is where my company specializes in coming in and partnering with the, the Olympics team and saying, what's realistic for you to achieve? What's not, what is the highest and best case use for these materials? Um, can we not just put dumpsters on site, but how are we making sure those dumpsters are producing a clean feedstock? Um, so they're not polluting our soils and that it's not just so contaminated that it's ending up in the dumpster. So putting dumpsters on site and saying like best of luck is not gonna be enough for these types of events. Composting technicians really developing a deep understanding of our soil health and, and developing a STEM arm of this, I think will be important, especially um, as LA uh, diversifies um, the type of workforce we're looking to see. Um, green asset and turf managers. So compost, you know, one huge focus for the LA Olympics is can we create a hyper local closed loop system? What does that mean? Can we compost all the material locally and then use the compost created from that material right back on the venues where the LA Olympics is being is taking place um, by spreading it on the turf grass there and creating uh, more vibrant um, more vibrant playing fields that don't have toxic, toxic chemical fertilizer inputs. But also, how can we support food production? So compost isn't just for um, turf land, but also it is for these urban farms that exist all throughout the city of LA that would love a high quality feedstock that starting with the compost site managers and zero uh, waste event coordinators has made sure it's clean and processed in the highest and best case yet um, so that we feel safe eating the food that this compost is coming from. Uh, you, and then, so what is this going to mean? What does this even entail? Well, I've talked about green jobs already, but you know, really what we want to do is feed hungry people first and then feed local soils first. So this, this, our proposal has a very local lens that we're looking through it, where we want to create carbon sinks in everybody's backyard, not truck the material 200 miles away. We're not sure what happened it. We hope for the best and then have that material either go to a different place in Kern County or have to be trucked back. Um, but also, so that, that touches base on this organics diversion element. Um, reducing greenhouse gases, yes, we already know composting does that, but local composting can do that right in our backyards by creating these carbon sinks through um, a distributed model of that compost material that's being created. Um, so not just going to the ball fields, like I was saying, but these urban farms where all throughout LA, it is sequestering carbon and creating healthier plants that also sequester carbon. Um, I've already touched based on human health and safety, but uh, in regards to not using chemical fertilizers and switching away from artificial turf grasses, but I'm gonna touch base a little bit on environmental justice in this program element and talking about 
where is this material truck being trucked to and who's bearing the brunt of our decision to host the Olympics here? Let's make sure we don't have nimbyism throughout our waste planning in the Olympics. How do Angelino say, not only are we going to take responsibility for the waste that is being polluted from this event, but also see it as a resource and utilize that resource to heal our soils right within this city. And, and trust me, there's a lot of soils needing healing, especially in the South LA area, which touches base on a whole nother environmental justice issue. So um, if we can heal those soils here, we create community resiliency and food sovereignty. And then finally, that resiliency that I was just touching base on is um, is seeing this as a resource um, and, and changing people's mindset and showing people that hyper-local closed-loop systems are possible even on the highest scale, that compostable LA compost and 301 organics are not cute little organizations doing cute little community things, but that we are really helping change the narrative. I loved that radical word she used. Um, I really think that that's what we're trying to do is say, yes, there's been a traditional way that waste has been managed. We've seen the way that has failed in a lot of capacities. Um, so how can we utilize the Olympics to really bolster a platform of how small waste haulers, quote unquote, even though I don't see this as waste, can manage even something at this scale. Great, thanks, thanks, Monique. I really appreciate it. Um, that was great. Um, so, a broader view of our proposal involves a few milestones beginning actually next year. Um, I know it's fast approaching, but um, we need to get some some um, pilots going um, and started. Um, as early as the first quarter of next year um, with with pilot composting um, operations at any one of the designated Olympic facilities that actually has expansive turf grass or a golf course. Um, we're looking at quarter two to possibly uh, begin developing the standard operating procedures um, for the collection side, the handling of the organics, um, and then uh, the on-site processing of the organics. Um, trying to standardize all of that. We all have this experience. Now it's just a matter of putting it to paper. Um, quarter three, we would be uh, um, conducting the, the turf trials um, using the finished compost on the turf and collecting that data and measuring it, the performance while also developing the standard operating procedures for its use. Um, in the third quarter of 2025, um, I think that's where I was talking about the standard operating procedures, yes. And then in quarter four of 2025, um, we would, once we have these standard operating procedures in place for collecting, handling, managing, we would be sharing that and distributing it to the other facilities where facilities may not have, have a system in place just yet. Um, in 2026, we anticipate rolling out the standard operating procedures for utilizing the compost on the golf course, golf courses or uh, ballparks and turf grasses. Again, trying to standardize and making this super simple to make that transition um, very seamless and, and easy. And then come the 2026 and 2027, we will have metrics to be reporting on. And by 2028, hopefully the facilities will already be operating and um, operating uh, seamlessly. The cool part about the reporting, if we were to, to uh, engage earlier on, um, is, is that it, it has a positive climate impact and the metrics can be collected and reported on well in advance. Um, the public, if messaged appropriately and effectively, can take pride in the investments that the city had made in the communities before, during, and after the games have ended. Um, these are some of the metrics. Oh, it doesn't look like it's showing up too well, but um, just going down the list of the many um, metrics we can gather um, ahead of time. Um, how many jobs did we create? How many composting systems that were installed? How many more community composting hubs were established? Um, how 
the amount of food recovered and fed to hungry people, um, the amount of spoiled food that was diverted and composted, and even how much compost was made and used, the amount of chemical inputs that was avoided, um, as well as the amount of greenhouse gases that were avoided from long distance hauling. Um, clearly, wherever we're putting the compost, whether it's shade trees or turf grass, we can actually, um, we can get the metrics for that. Um, and so the city could po quite possibly uh, document how much cooler the local climate has become from implementing these practices if we, if we get started early on. And with that, um, I'm going to close and thank you. Open it up to questions. All right, thank you, Christine and Monique and Michael. Uh, can you please stop uh, sharing your screen? Thank you. Thank you. And board, can you please um, unspotlight them so we can see everybody? Thank you very much. Okay, I think we can probably get away with about four minutes of conversation. I know Kathy, Kathy Schreiner, are you here? Yes. Oh, Kathy? yes. oh good. Because I know you sent me an email. My head was far too full. I read the words, but the words did not go in my brain. So right. I, I hope you, okay. I, I mean, if you can, I'm, I, some other hands are raised, but I'm hoping you can chime in maybe after them. I don't know if we have time because we really do have to get to our committee reports. Maybe we can go until 8.10. Let's, we can probably go get away with that. Let's see how it goes. We I don't know if we can get away with a vote. Probably I don't have time for a vote tonight, but I'm thinking maybe we can do a vote via email if we do a conversation tonight. And Terry is raising and is nodding her head. So maybe that's what we'll do because Terry is very wise. Okay, Andy, we've got Andy. We've got Andy. This is very cool. We have Andy Schrader, you guys. Did I scare him away? No, he's just put down his hand. Andy, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you. Uh, my my, my first question was was about the inside Andy? of Leith. Can you hear me? You have to you have to introduce yourself. Not every most people know you. Maybe not. Uh, no, Andy Schrader is one of the founding members of the Mar Vista Community Council, um, <laughs> and I helped found the uh, the NCSA uh, back in uh, 2013. Uh, I also worked for Council Member Karatz for. Uh, the last decade minus the last two years. Um, so I just want to give, uh, uh, Lisa said this was a little controversial. I don't think this is controversial at all. Uh, we introduced uh, with Michael, we wrote the legislation to create Regenerate LA. Um, and I'll put the the link in the chat to the, the LA Healthy Soils uh, legislation, which a number of neighborhood councils uh, supported, and it was approved by the the city council. Um, it's it's one of the ways to really help deal with the city's food waste to uh, to to uh, to meet the state's SB 1383 requirements, and uh, really create the circular economy that we've all been talking about for such a long time, and actually use the LA Olympics to the, the LA 28 Olympics to bring something positive and lasting to the city. Um, you know, so so I don't think it's controversial at all. I urge you to vote on it tonight. Uh -huh. I would leap through the screen and vote on it. And uh, and really, it's it's a terrific proposal. So uh, congratulations, you guys. It's it's Thank I'm you. excited about this. Oh, and good. the bigger picture is uh, if we create the healthy soil on a widespread basis across the country and across the world, we can actually cool the planet. So keep that in mind. And this can be a big part of that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andy. It's lovely to see you, even though it's just this, oops. And then he went, of course I say that and he goes away. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> People still um, exist even if their camera is off, Lisa. <laughs> Object permanence. We're supposed to learn that when we're like three or four or something. Anyway, uh, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Forbes. Um, uh, great presentation. I love the idea of composting, especially with food scraps uh, and uh, beneficial not only to the environment and, and zero waste. Um, I'm curious, however, that you seem to have focused on spreading the compost on 
um, golf courses. I may have missed it, but uh, are there further plans to use that in public parks and other areas uh, in, in greater amounts? Yeah, I, I, thanks for your question, Mark. I'll answer that really quick. Um, we're currently in three, soon to be seven city and county parks and all that finished compost both stays on the park site itself with or without a golf course. And then we have monthly distribution events where we give that compost back to LA residents for free. Different than LA Sanitation's big drop-off in bulks that come from different locations. But the goal is um, from a golf course perspective to um, eliminate chemical uses of um, so soil conditioners and so on. Um, on large acres, but um, absolutely, we anticipate that composting stain in LA for yeah. urban farms, community gardens, easements, parkways, um, but primarily the carbon sinks in our urban parks as well. Yeah, and and if I could add to to that, the golf course focus for for us is because the Brookside Golf Course was adjacent to the Rose Bowl Stadium for the many years that we were there, so we were able to really take advantage of that scenario and the campus to be able to test the waters, test the compost we were making, test the liquid compost, figure out how we were going to apply it at scale, you know, with what um, tools or with what conveyance systems. Um, so that was our, our backyard and, you know, with LA compost, it's they're they're in they're in Griffith Park next to the golf course. So that's how our partnership kind of evolved was um a lot of diff we we were operating very synergistically. And so now we're coming together for, for this initiative. Thank you. Uh, okay, Kathy. Hi. So I, I want to make clear that Can I just introduce love yourself, introduce yourself, please. Very oh, brief. okay. Kathy Schreiner. I'm the president of the Van Nuys Neighborhood Council. I'm a member of NCSA and especially the Trees Committee. Um, I love all the ideas about the local compost and the local hubs and the jobs and everything else. So, but I read the, I think it's five page proposal and there were a few references to artificial turf. And I feel that we should not be combining artificial turf with this particular proposal. Because there's so many, you know, um, like removing the chemical fertilizers, there's so many benefits. And we have a whole separate initiative on artificial turf, which doesn't have as much to do with the Olympics. Yeah. We hope, if I could just add, we, we hope that if, if this does move forward with LA-28, that we would be able to... Um, um, have have these metrics to prove and, and the evidence to prove that natural turf managed with organic inputs and non-chemicals would be the way to go because we can prove lower irrigation, which translates into cost savings, lower, um, obviously, chemical inputs, translates into lower costs, and then, of course, the hauling piece. So, um, Cost is obviously a very big thing, but if we can save that money on natural turf management with organics and compost, then that we can bank that for hiring for those green jobs that are that would be more permanent. And and all that makes sense. I just won't. I would just like to trim down yeah, this proposal to focus. Yeah. Okay, will do. Thank you. Okay, so sorry. Uh, it's eight oh nine. I don't. I, what's the, what's the rationale, Kathy? What's wrong with mentioning artificial turf in the proposal? Because I don't believe the Olympic venues that I have heard that we're talking about trying to replace artificial turf. This proposal, as I you know heard it at advocacy and as I read in the proposal, is this whole idea about being able not you know, not to have to move uh, you know the compost around to be able to do it locally to create these jobs to all, all the benefits everything that was cited. It's just that artificial turf is something that has to be taken away in order to replace with other things. And I just don't think that's part of this particular proposal. I see, okay, got it, okay, okay, okay. And Andy, that was the, my only concern is that Kathy had a concern. Otherwise I think it's great. And that's a very minor concern that, yeah, is easily fixed. Okay, uh, Joanne. Just wanted to know how the compost is cleaned um, since uh, food waste can be, um, can have fertilizers and so forth. You know, it's not necessarily organic food that goes into it. Michael, you want to take I think, that? I think 
I think we can all speak to contaminations, at least the one that we can see. PFAs is like a nice deep dive for four hours later, as far as forever chemicals that we can't see in microplastics and beyond. As local composters, I think Monique brought up a good point that we don't just like drop off a dumpster. Where there's a human element and presence to allow for knowledge sharing and education from a sorting standpoint, at least with LA Compost, we're at 15 farmers markets throughout LA, where we're able to stop contaminants before it gets into our bin. We hand turn or it's small scale. So we're able to remove contaminants while we're engaging with the pile. And then we sift it by hand. So there's three opportunities to actually remove the contaminants that we don't want in the pile versus just a large tip dumpster into a massive um, windrow that's mechanical mechanical and not touched at all. So um, we very much believe in um, knowledge sharing, education, and having a strong human element presence. And by keeping it small and local, somewhat micro, we're able to manage a lot of the contaminants um, because we're engaging with the material every throughout the week. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to touch base really quick. This is where our my company specializes in, in that we are often hired for productions, galas, um, large scale events. And my staff will touch every piece of trash that comes off the floor at that event to make sure as much material that is potentially in the trash that can be composted is sorted into the compost pile, but also trash that's in the compost is sorted out of the compost pile. And that's why there's been, it, it shows that the, the high quality of the material being produced, it's, it's quite low in contamination, but we also have gone through so many tests with our farm partners to make sure the right disposables are being sourced. So truly compostable materials that don't have PFAS or hard to process PLAs. Um, so when you're sourcing the, the compost products, those have already been tested and, and approved by um, a, our local farmers. And then at the events, we have sorters there that are um, maximizing diversion and minimizing contamination. Then you have, like Michael said, his people on site during the actual turning process and the, the sifting process. Um, but also Christine is kind of also proposing maybe we use some technology and maybe there's tech that could be used um, that helps with, you know, pre-processing the material that makes sorting a little bit easier. So there's, there's several safeguards along the way. And right. I, I do want to add, oh, that's fine. <laughs> we are, we are way past time. I'm feeling pressured by Andy to vote. Muriel, do you know how many voters we have here? Uh, we have 17. So I could, I could. 17 I could. voters? Okay. Well, do we want to, uh, how are, can I just get a feel from anybody in the room if you want to try to vote tonight or not? Charles wants us to vote. Andy wants us to vote. Terry wants us to vote. Okay. Uh, Aurora wants us to vote. Let's try to vote. Muriel, can you, uh, okay. Muriel wants us to vote. Well, okay. Uh, say what we're voting on. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, what are we? Are we voting on a modified version with of the concept proposal that was put in the chat and that is on our website? It's like a five page document, which is basically um, this, but we could modify it, removing artificial turf language. Sure. Does that work for folks? We can do that. Yeah. Works. Okay, Um. let me start with Aurora. Yes. Yes, uh, Lisa. Yes. Uh, Charles? Yes. Uh, Alex? Yes. Um, I vote yes. Oh my gosh, I forgot to ask me. Um, Joanne? Yes. Yes. Uh, Eric Newton? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know I was allowed to vote tonight. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're, yeah. I, I, I marked yeah. Um, you. AJ? Yes. <laughs> Oh yeah, okay. I heard you say yes. Uh, Pat Bates. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Charlene Moyer. Yes. Okay. Uh, Nan Kim. I think I don't know. If she... <coughs> and... Just keep going. Okay, sorry. Um, Kathy Schreiner. Yes. Okay. Glenn Bailey. Yes. Thank you. Um, Terry. Saucier. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lionel? Can you circle back on that? What did you I'm say sorry? 
Um, I was wondering if you could circle back. I'm still thinking. Oh, oh okay, okay. Um, uh, Cindy. Yes. Thank you. And uh, Miran. Miran, okay, yes. Okay. Okay, and we're back to Lionel, and I'm double checking if Nan either left. Could have sworn. I just sent you a text message. Oh, thank. Oh, thank you. Okay. Good thing you guys are in the same board. Um, Lionel, we're back to you. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. This is I unanimous. I love enthusiasm. <laughs> okay. It is. Um, yes. Um, seventeen zero zero. <laughs> okay, and I just realized I should I should have been getting ready to share my slides. I was getting too relaxed. Okay, thank you. So uh, congratulations, Christine and Monique and Michael. I'm excited about this. Obviously, everybody's excited about this. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, and we'll see what happens next. And thank you for sharing this. This is really, really intriguing. And, you know, I mean, I agree with Andy. It's really what we should, I mean, it makes sense, right? It's what we should be doing. Appreciate it. Okay. I Thanks, need to guys. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. It's very inspiring. Uh, I need to find my slides. They were here earlier. I don't know why they're not here now. Um, but they're not. <sighs> they're on page six of the uh, run of show. What, what do you mean? That's not helpful. Well, I mean, we could you can share screen and just use that URL. Oh, I mean, they're open. I mean, I can. Uh, I understand. I think I'm just but... going to talk. Um, okay. That, anyway, that doesn't help me. But um, I think I'm just going to talk about things uh, while I try to find them. So uh, from the advocacy committee, Andy, are you still here? Do you want to? Are you still here, Andy? Can somebody see? Because I'm looking for my slide. Yes, he is. Well, can you ask him to talk about the Wildlife Corridor Ordinance, please? Hi. What? What? Uh, what? I, I, my <laughs> slides, I don't know how it is, but my slides disappeared. So I'm going to look for them. And if you could talk about the Wildlife Corridor Ordinance, that would be very helpful. And if somebody from the board could put the link that Andy made into the chat, that would be very helpful. I just did that, Lisa. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, we've been... Councilmember Karatz introduced a, uh, and this is not a prepared speech, uh, introduced legislation back in 2014 to protect mm -hmm. wildlife habitat connectivity in the hillsides in a pilot area uh, that kind of became the hillside area between the 101 and the 405. The uh, The planning department has, has drug its heels for most of those, uh, what, now 10 years and we've we've pushed hard and pushed hard. Councilmember Koretz hired uh, a biologist, uh, eco ecologist, to work with the planning department to get it done. And we fought through every budget cycle to get it funded, um, just on and on and on. Meanwhile, there are some some very wealthy real estate folks who don't even actually live in the city of LA who've been fighting this and spreading misinformation among the hillside folks, saying that it's gonna cost them money and, and blah, blah, blah. It's actually not. If you can, it, anytime there's a conservation district, um, housing prices actually go up because of scarcity. So uh, it, it's just, it, it's really troubling that a bunch of, of super rich people are trying to uh, negatively impact you know, whoever comes next, their P22 passed away and inspired all of this, but um, we want to protect the next P22. And there's there are, are at least two uh, untagged mountain lions roaming around in the hillsides up there right now. Um, so the goal 
is to um, right before Councilmember Coretz ended his term in in uh, December 2022, we got the ordinance through uh, committee. It went back. Uh, planning worked on it some more, and they've they've weakened it each time there's been a vote. And then there was it was supposed to be on the planning committee, the Plum Committee uh, agenda this Tuesday. It didn't show up. And then uh, uh, Councilwoman Yaroslavsky uh, announced that she's hosting a virtual meeting on Wednesday at seven o'clock. Um, there's been dozens of public meetings. So it's it's another uh, kind of troubling slowdown. But uh, what we need and what my ask would be for, for anybody who can attend is attend the meeting at 7 p.m. on Wednesday and give some positive voices to uh, to this really groundbreaking um, uh, ordinance that we really need. And and one of the most important things is when L.A. does something, it, it doesn't stay in L.A. It echoes and and other major cities can see that that they can create uh, legislation to protect the environment and the creatures that they share their environment with. So it would be super helpful if anybody could could attend the meeting and and speak in favor of it because the uh, the real estate industry certainly has their knives out and um, and we need we need all hands on deck for this one and we're almost there we're so close we really we we need to get this done by the end of the year um, or they're gonna try to just kill it forever so anyway that's my quick my quick two cents and my kids are starting to invade so uh, thanks for letting me speak, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. That was super helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, more things going on. The Comprehensive Plastics Reduction Program PER was certified, which means we have more plastics legislation coming, which is good. And we are actually talking about trying to enforce it because we have some fun plastics um, ordinances, but they're not being enforced. So they're really frustrating. Hi, Cora. This is Lisa. I don't know if you remember me, but it's nice to see you. Um, Charter Reform Commission is so, uh, slowly getting, uh, folks are getting appointed to it. It's moving more slowly than it was supposed to. Uh, we are working very slowly and frustratingly, uh, or frustratedly, I should say, on our bioswales. Sepulveda Basin, uh, we recently submitted a letter saying that we are also frustrated about the Sepulveda Basin artificial turf. Uh, next, uh, Our next meeting is going to be about artificial turf. Please come. We're hoping to have uh, lots of experts or a few experts talking about actually how we do this. Very related to the conversation we just had about how we actually... Um, get off of artificial turf, because it's sort of like an addiction. How do you move away from it? So please join us next month, December 8th, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, we had a slightly more sustainable Congress of neighborhoods this year, but it wasn't as sustainable as we would like, so we're working on that. Uh, we just had the conversation about organics management, uh, and so we're gonna keep talking about that. We might get a um, housing committee, that would be fun. And we are working on landscaping uh, for wildfire resilience. And next meeting, we're gonna talk about the plant-based treaty, which Andy was involved with. And you're welcome to join us. Uh, Energy, AJ. Sorry for the delay. Um, yes, hi, um, AJ, Energy Committee Chair. So um, just some quick updates to highlight. So um, for, for those of you who don't regularly come to our Energy Committee, the first item is that we've been working on advocacy um, towards um, around urban oil drilling. And one of the main ones that we've been working with was with this community called Vista Hermosa, which is located in the Temple Beaudry area. So just a quick high level overview for those of you not familiar with the issue, that um, this is around the ongoing developments of apartment buildings over uncapped oil wells. Um, you know, there's been a history of incidences of spills, even though the oil wells are idle and not active. 
So the latest, so so the latest um, from because we've had multiple tours with this already, all the way up to CD one, was we did hit a little bit of a we did hit a little bit of a of a roadblock with CD one for a little bit, but um, we've actually made some strides because we've been working on a draft motion to. You know, to just to help mitigate with a lot of the entities around the city and around the state. So we're now working collaboratively with CD1, um, drafting the language for the motion. So they haven't pushed it forward yet, but our goal is to push a council file on that. So we're just happy to hear now that we're not at a standstill with CD1. Um, also, um, you know, Lisa's continuing to work to see if um, if staff members from the city attorney's office can come out on on another tour. Um, the second item is um, I have been following and sharing with the committee the UCLA Aliso Canyon Disaster Health Study. So they just had their community meeting on Thursday. So um, I won't be able to touch on everything. I'll be going in depth in the committee meeting. But one of the key takeaways was um, the was the investigative group just just finished a focus group, and it was it was more on behavioral analysis. The consensus from the community was that. Um, I think the clinicals is what is is what's most needed. So there's a push for that, even though the community is frustrated that after nine years of disaster, we're now pushing for the clinicals. So um, this was the last community meeting of the of the year. The second thing is that they'll be focusing more on risk assessment. So reason for you know keeping this as an agenda item is. Um, you know, just to just to maintain just to maintain trust um, to keep this investigative group honest. Um, as far as with the LADWP grant, so one of the conversations that we've been having around it, and I'll let Lisa speak a little bit more to this, is that um, we've been having conversations around the focus of savings around around heat pumps as well as um, just, you know, conversation on, you know, potential savings around electrification. Um, and that's it for my item. Our meetings are every third Wednesday at 7 p.m. So hope to see you all there. And Lisa, I'll pass it on to you for your item in relation to this. Thank you very much. Um... We want selfie videos spreading the word about home electrification because we're trying to really spread the word to folks who we can't reach. So please think about doing a, like a 15 to 30 second video saying something great about the home electrification or about how important it is or something along those lines and tagging us. And this information is on our... Uh, website and if somebody from the board can put that uh, link in the chat that would be super helpful thank you okay um muriel you're up uh hello um i'm the transportation committee chair if i if you guys didn't remember from what i said earlier um so i'm just i'm just going to do a recap from the the last meeting and this past meeting this, this past thursday um so on, like on in the October meeting, we had AJ Water recap the conference he went to for EVs and also um, electrical sources. So that kind of bled into energy as well. And then on in November, Phyllis Lane came out and did some stop the gondola updates. Um, state parks were, you know, they were holding meetings. There were town halls like from from February up till now. Um, there is going to be a traffic report that will be up. Sub, um, subject to um, pub, um, public um, public outcome, um, uh, public input. And I think that'll start next uh, early next year. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, you could email me. And if you want to be added to the email list, you could email me. Thank you. All right, Joanne. All right. Hi. Uh, okay, I'm Joanne D'Antonio. I'm chair of the Trees Committee. And our next meeting is a week from yesterday, uh, November 23rd. It'll be on Zoom, 1.30 to 3.30. Um, I sent the Zoom link already to um, 
everyone on our 180 person list. Um, if you're not on it and would like to be, my email is at the bottom of this card. Um, this next meeting, uh, we're proposing to create a flyer uh, depicting some right and wrong ways to trim trees that can be used at events. We can make this flyer available electronically and, and uh, neighbor councils can print it. Um, possibly we'll ask the NCSA to print it at the, for the next Congress. Um, the, the draft flower that I sent out is not finalized. It's just an idea that one of the trees committee members put together and uh, it's not in any way, shape or final form. Um, we also are gonna uh, consider um, a, a propose, we're gonna propose a new campaign for neighbor councils to send letters to city officials um, advocating for trees. These to come not from individuals like our thousand postcards, but to come from neighbor councils on, as a formal uh, position letter from each council. Um, we will probably come up with a draft. This is just in the very um, thought stages. Uh, it hasn't been really discussed and this will be our first discussion of this possibility. Um, and um, I'd like to ask everyone here to please support Council File 241312 which came as a result of uh, the Valley Village Neighborhood Council discovering that um, someone, a, a property owner who had removed, uh, legally removed a protected tree, uh, sycamore tree did not plant the mitigation trees, only planted one and the other three trees Instead of planting them, he installed artificial turf in his backyard. So we're going to be, um, so this was, I, I went, excuse me, I went to the neighborhood council committee meeting and I was with them for an hour and we came to the conclusion that the best thing they could do would be to really pressure the council office um, because this property was awarded a certificate of occupancy and it's also up for sale. So this, this council motion would require that Urban Forestry um, make an inspection to make sure that the trees were planted before there could be a certificate of occupancy given by LADBS. Um, apparently, the property owner was trying to forfeit the bond because there is a bond, ten thousand dollar bond, and um, and just um, not plant the trees. So um, we're trying to get around that so that, that they don't get around our protected tree ordinance. And lastly, um, I'm going to do a demonstration of the Urban Forestry's new proposed tree removal web postings. Um, I did one at the last uh, meeting, but it's changed and it's no longer wobbly and it's got a lot more information. It's got some data, it's got some graphs. Um, it's, it's actually rather impressive. So if you um, would like to follow what are the proposed tree removals, you can actually uh, search it by your neighborhood council or by your council district and find out just those that are in your district and also tell you if a permit's been issued so you don't um, try to get involved with something that's already a fait accompli. Um, it is useful to know how to use the city tree inventory and uh, I will uh, demonstrate that as well. I've done that before. Um, sometimes uh, the tree, proposed tree removal listings will, will list um, two, they will list a tree to be removed. And when you go to the site on Google Maps, you'll see that there are two of those trees there and you don't know which one they're talking about. Well, the city tree inventory, because every tree has an ID, Urban Forestry will list that and the city tree inventory will enable you to figure out which tree it is and see a picture of it. Um, no longer putting the listings on the NCSA trees website. 
Um, what what was done in the past is still there for your reference, but I'm not going to, um, it would be redundant to what Urban Forestry is doing. So I stopped. Um, that's it. Thank you. I hope to see you on Saturday. Um, it should be a good meeting. And if you have other issues that we've not discussed, oh, one more thing, the landscape ordinance, Lisa brought this up in an email to me today. It did pass um, city, um, the city commission, the planning commission. And um, I, I have some questions. A lot, some, a lot of our things that we asked for are in it, but how they're in it, um, they're in there as options and a certain number of points have to be fulfilled. So I'm having a meeting with um, the folks that made this uh, ordinance that does, that put the point system together to find out more about um, whether it's easily circumvented. They said that they did, I think, 20 projects, existing projects recent, and said that they all fulfilled the 27 points that they needed to fulfill, which frightened me because I just wonder, uh, are we not getting anything better with this landscape ordinance? So I am going to have a meeting this week and try to see what projects they utilized in making that determination. That's it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Time for announcements. And Natalie wants to, I don't know if she wants to follow up on Joanne or make an announcement, but uh, Natalie, the yeah, floor is yours. And I know we're over time, so let's try to wrap things up so people can can do just whatever the heck really they quick want to do. Joanne, do Natalie? you know when that motion, um, 24, 13, 12, do you know when that's being heard in committee? No. Um... And I worry about this because Council Member Krikorian is going to be gone <laughs> in a matter of weeks. So, uh, and it's his motion. So I, I don't know. I guess it it has to go to um, what energy and environment. I guess we would have to um, ask that they that they agendize it. It looks like it was referred to Public Works. I'll see if oh, I can. Public Works. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I, I I couldn't remember which committee. Yeah, we we should. Uh, if you have any connection with the chair of public works, um, well, it's 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 Lee, isn't it? Um, perhaps I can get uh, Marianne King to, who's on the trees committee, to uh, ask him to agendize it. I, I think I can uh, do that. Um, can a board member please put the eval link in one more time, please? Thank you. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Charles. Yeah, so I just I just pasted this in the chat member in the chat as well. Very quickly. Um, uh, climate LA Climate Reality Project on Monday, uh, November 25th at 7 p.m. We'll be having our chapter meeting and we do a series that we call Climate Movers and Shakers. We've had Lisa featured. We've had Terry featured. We've had um, really famous people, you know, so it's people who are engaged in the climate effort. Uh, our guest for this next meeting will be David Heron, who, as we discussed, is the author of the Artificial Turf uh, Council file. And uh, we will be discussing his career and also how he ran for the assembly and lost, and then he found another lane to do climate work. And uh, so, you know, we just had election results, so we thought that would be a good theme for this. But inevitably, there's going to be discussion of artificial turf because David is heavily involved in that issue. So if you're interested in that, please join us and uh, everybody's welcome to to be there. The link is in uh, the chat. Thank you. All right. Any other announcements? Really quick, Lisa, I just wanted to thank Charles. Uh, Pico Union now has the first median landscape with California natives, first of its kind. So thank you, Charles. That just happened uh, over the weekend on Saturday. Thank you. And poor Aurora Charles Harvey. ran across yeah. the valley to go pick them up and brought them back. So thank you, Charles. Okay. There's quite a story that most people here do not know. <laughs> and we do not have time to share, but quite a story, you guys, behind that. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Uh, good night. Please fill out the evaluation and I hope to see you guys on the 8th uh, for more of a conversation about how to actually make the artificial turf thing happen. So stay tuned. And I know the uh, election was not very fun and it means um, it means a lot, but you know, we have four years to figure it out. All right. Good night. Night.